in the in the 70s and especially in the well, 70s until about mid 80s all the the white guys in South Africa had to go to the army or go to as conscripts or go to jail or leave the country and uh, they were they were called up when they were 16, 17 years old. Um, so I don't think of them even as adults. They were boys. And afterwards, one can look back at it. Many of them, many of men of my generation think, how could we do that? How, why didn't more of us just say, no, we don't want to fight this war? Um, and I was fascinated by that because if you're that young, there's also a, kind of a brainwashing thing involved and it's very hard to make a decision not to go and fight for a government um, which you know, maybe they didn't know at that stage, the apartheid government. So it's that whole thing and it was my generation. It was really the, the, the boys in my school class who were called up. Right. And so, so that's the, and it's something that bothered me. Well, not, you know, you don't really choose your stories. My, one of my first books that I wrote um, in the early 90s already had a character looking back to the teenage years of that so-called secret war where South Africa, South Africa was, fighting, um, was fighting in Angola. Right. But we were not supposed, we were supposed to be fighting the Namibian on the border, but secretly the, the soldiers were deep in Angola and the Cubans came to help on the Angolan side um, so it's in a third country. The South Africans' family didn't know they were there because the government was just denying it. And so it was until finally a few South African soldiers got caught and displayed before the world audience. And yeah. So this woman feels that she is complicit. She finds, she finds this letter. It's her ex-husband. They've been divorced for many years and he dies. And she finds this letter that a Cuban soldier wrote to his, well, she finds out it's a little baby. And it never got posted. Right. Um, and she feels she has to go and find out, deliver this letter to make up for her husband's, her ex-husband's involvement and to try and find out what that war was actually about. This is the thing, though. It's a secret war. So what resistance have you had to writing this? Has there been a backlash? Have people thanked you for writing it? What's, what's the response been? It's very interesting because in South Africa, um, white South Africans, there's still a denial under a part of the um, population. Guys of uh, over the age of 45, I would say, and upwards, who find it very hard to admit, you know, they were fighting on the wrong side. They were fighting not on the side of the angels. Um, they were fighting on the, the, the bad guy's side. Um, and afterwards so when when this book came out um yes it was i wasn't prepared for the violent reaction i got from white south africans especially men who were conscripts they came to the book uh, launches in their old soldiers uniforms um and wrote letters to me as if i was this complete traitress um a white woman basically saying, why did you do that? That war, after all, wasn't fair. So, so it was traumatic, but also um, uh, uh, from the side of... There was also a lot of people in the audience literally crying and thanking me, which is an emotional reaction I've never had with any other book, because men coming back from a war that goes for all wars, I think, you can't speak to your family about it. You don't, so my, my own personal ex-husband, you know, as Marita van der Pfeiffer, I was married a long time ago to a guy who was completely messed up by that war. He ended his life in a mental institution. Um, so there's also some personal experience in, in this. Well, I was going to come to that, actually, the personal experience, because reading your memoir and your book, Borderline, which have come out within a few years of each other, about a year. About a year, yeah. right. So you, you reading your memoir and Borderline, there's some overlap between your experience and the protagonist, Teresa. And I wanted to ask about one thing because Teresa in the book is progressive but doesn't push it as far as she wants. And there's a line in your memoir where you talk about being, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite scared and quite timid, but I've forced myself 
Despite being scared and timid, I pushed myself into places that I didn't think I would. If you were Teresa's friend at the time that she was making her big decisions, what advice would you have given her in relation to speaking out, being more vocal? What advice would you have given Teresa? Do you mean Teresa as when she decides to go to Cuba? Just yeah, oh, I think and, uh, even younger. Pri even prior to Cuba, I would say like within South Africa, if that makes sense. If I yes, I would say that you you she, you have to push yourself sometimes. You see, if as a as a white person you speak out um, about what's wrong there, um, you are is it's you are seen still today in the new so-called new South Africa, democratic South Africa. We have you you could still be seen. Um, as a traitor by your own people, right? Yes, yes. So-called own people. So it's it's that thing. So yes, one has to just speak out. But I didn't write this book to condemn every single guy who fought. I tried to to um, to draw a line through between the South African. Some of those South African conscripts went there, not knowing into a country they've never been, not knowing why they're going there. In the same way, a lot of the Cuban soldiers were conscripted and sent to a country very far from home where they spoke another language because it was Portuguese, the Cubans were speaking Spanish, the South Africans were speaking South African um, English accent. Um, so th they all for ideology, which I don't know if any of the soldiers actually understood why they were killing each other. This is the thing, that in the book, there's um, a couple of themes that really stand out. One of them is silence, silence about the war, um, the silence that death leaves behind, the silence of complicity. But the other theme that I notice is bravery or the absence of bravery. So specifically bravery in relation to, into lo in relation to love. Uh, there's an act of bravery by Therese in the novel in going to Cuba not knowing what reaction she'll get from the family. It could be hostile, but she still goes anyway. That's very brave. But there's also a moment where she sort of chooses not to push things further with the guy that, her guide, Ruben, who takes her around. And I want to talk about that bravery. You know, once you get to kind of, once you get to your middle age, you're afraid to open up and love. Talk to me about the bravery to love, even though you're in the sort of your middle ages. Yes, that was a, that was a line that, Afterwards, a lot of um, readers, well, I don't think it's a spoiler if we say, okay, you wonder, there's a Cuban char character and uh, who Teresa gets to know quite a few Cuban people who show her more of Cuba. And this one guy, a taxi driver, um, helps her along. And I think a lot of readers were kind of waiting for, for a, rela a, a sexual relationship to develop between Teresa and Ruben. So, okay, now I can't really talk about it b b because it's without giving you know, spoilers. But th Teresa had to be very brave because um, she's a middle-aged woman. She's in her 50s. And Ruben is a guy of about the same age. And he's shy and she's shy. And how, how far, who takes the first step, the fear of rejection, which doesn't get easier when you get older. It probably gets worse after 50. Um, uh, uh, exposing your body, when you expose your body at 25 or 30 to somebody you don't know that well, it's easier. So it's that also, which, which uh, for Teresa, she really wants to get closer to Ruben, but there's that incredible fear, vulnerability, fear of rejection. Right. That kind of keeps her. But it's funny because I read that character. I read her conversation with herself in Cuba. It's a form of healing because with her husband, Theo, he's really harsh about, you know, because she, they miscarry, she miscarries, I think, three times, mm. um, a couple of times when she's with her husband. And he says some very cruel things about her body and what's happening to it. And I almost feel like to what extent in, in the book is her time in Cuba a form of like healing in relation to her own body and her sense of self? Yes, I think what she finds in Cuba is a is a is a is a, a, a sensuality of people around her, um, people who are at ease with their bodies, and 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 she she just making friends with people that she didn't know who were seen as the enemy when she grew up. Now she becomes friends with people, and she sees um, the differences and the, the similarities, um, she meets at least two Cubans 
of more or less her age who were in the ward and one is in a wheelchair. Um, uh, and so she sees the other side. And she, f she goes back and she says to her sister or another character, yes, I feel like a garden that's been raked open because I, I was like a dead garden for a very long time. No, nothing was growing there anymore. And now just from these like 10 days or two weeks in Cuba and seeing another part of my own history, admitting things, I feel like a garden that things can grow in again. Well, this is funny. You talk about her exposing herself, which she does so well. And you talk about the huge emotional response this book has had. I wonder, having read quite a bit of your memoir, how much of your, how much of your book's emotional power do you think came from your vulnerability? How much do you think, you know, because you put a lot of yourself into this novel, how much of that vulnerability do you think powered the book forward? Probably a lot, because I am, yes, I am not a brave person. I think a lot of writers are actually braver in our work than we are in our personal lives. Um, and I can say things in my work that I find hard to, um, to verbalize um, all the time. So, yes, so I had to, um, you know, just push myself. But it wasn't, at the same time, it wasn't, I mean, I'm not trying to say, yes, I'm a heroine because I was standing in front of a firing squad. It's nothing to do with that. It was just, I think as a writer, we all have to try and be as honest as we can. Um, so it was just trying to tell, mm, to be as honest as I can in, in telling the story. Right, and one thing you do in this book is, I feel like it's funny because the overarching theme is war, but there's a hopefulness of love and the unpredictability of where we find love. And without giving anything, without giving anything away, one of the main characters in the book who turns out to be a main character has a couple of interesting and unexpected romantic relationships. How much do you see love as, and the unpredictability of it, as a way to find our way through these troubling times? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you verbalize it much better than I do. I didn't write the book and thought, okay, I'm going to bring in different love affairs and so. But yes, in a way, right towards the end, she reads the letter um, when she stands um, uh, there in France, in, um, in Freedom Park in South Africa. So I'm not saying who's reading the letter, but there is the actual, for the first time, right at the end of the book, the actual letter, that the whole book is about a letter being delivered. So now it's being read. Um, Teresa knows the letter. She reads what this Cuban soldier, knowing he's going to die, would write to his child. Knowing he's never going to see this baby again. Knowing that if the Cuban um, uh, authorities find the letter, they wouldn't deliver it either because he was not saying good things about the war. It's an, an anti-war letter, basically. Um, and so... That is, to me, um, was a strong thing because, yes, I'm very much <laughs> against war, um, but there is, there's a small lines of love, which is like thin, thin lines that, that keep us, that thin little beams of light to find, to find one another. Absolutely, and I think that, that's the thing that you really, you sense early in the book that there's some kind of love dragging you towards the end of the book. But I want to ask you something on a technical level. So technically, this book is a very difficult thing to pull off because you've got this letter and this quest to deliver this letter. And you have to suspend the reader's... You've got to keep the reader's interest for an entire book, essentially in a quest to deliver one item. Mm. What techniques did you use to kind of suspend, keep the, keep the reader, like, intrigued to the end? It's probably the closest to... Um to a crime fiction that I've ever written. Oh, I was going to say, right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, yeah. Looked, I've never written crime fiction, but I looked at my friends writing crime fiction, and for instance, the South African Dion Mayer, uh, he's, he's widely translated, he's an old friend of mine, and he always says, you know, that there must be a body within the first page, and then you must st draw, stretch out the, the tension, keep, keep things happening. So I've always thought my books are not at all like that. It's all about character. It's character driven. It's not plot driven at all. But with this book, I knew that I had to, um, you know, go a little bit into, like think a little bit more like a crime novelist. So 
to keep the reader. She was on a search. It was like, uh, like a detective looking for a murderer. She wasn't looking for a murderer. She was looking for somebody some, so for, to deliver a letter to somebody who would be now about 40 years old and maybe somewhere in Cuba. She doesn't have the address anymore. So I had to give some false piste, as we say in, in French, false, false uh, yes, le yes. leads. And, um, and then finally in getting her there and meeting people who help her along the way and so on to to keep the tension up. And one of the things I think that helped, and I've spoken to other writers also, we don't necessarily know how it's going to end when we right. start writing. Um, uh, we write to see the ending, to, to get to the ending. And I had a vague idea, but I didn't know how Teresa is going to, is she actually going to deliver the letter? Where is she going to deliver? How the hell is she going to find this person in Cuba? It's funny you say that because I felt like it was a, some might read it as a political novel, but it's really about love, but actually it's really a crime thriller and it's a murder mystery, only the murder was committed by the South African state in terms of- 40 years ago. It, it, murdered, it <laughs> murdered the innocence of this generation of, of yes. men. Yes. Um, it's funny how you foreshadow the male violence in the war with misogyny within the family structure. It's really interesting. So you have, um, one of the characters is involved in a, a violent incident with a member of the other family. And that kind of foreshadows the future they're gonna have. How important was it for you to express where that kind of bullying begins? Oh yes, um, maybe I should just explain to the listeners. So there's uh, flashbacks. Um, all the time while she's in Cuba on this quest, um, there's flashbacks to when she was a teenager in South Africa or in her twenties and so on. And there's a, a very important um, happening where a young guy, uh, a br an older brother of a friend, attacks her and the friend. They, they're 15, 16 years old. He's cross because they came in late at night from a party and he physically hits the sister. Um, the mother doesn't want to see it uh, because it's, uh, he's the blue-eyed boy of the mother. And he's the guy who wants to go to army. He can't wait to go to army. Uh, he wants to leave school because he wants to go in army and fight this war. He is eager. Um, so, yes, I think I needed to bring that in because a lot of, not only the South African um, society, there's a lot of uh, macho behavior um, in, in a lot of societies with men being violent um, and hitting sisters and then maybe wives and so on. And it all, in the end, adds up to, to the experience of war. In the end, you end up in a war and you kill other people um, because you are desensitized already in a way. That's really interesting. And I, I wonder about, because the choices you make even in that scene the choice to make the mother most sympathetic to the boy after all plays out is interesting because that's something that tracks with your memoir. You're talking about the fear of the overbearing society of men and the women kind of go along. Yes. That's a fascinating thing. Could you talk about, you know, those women who feel they have to maintain the lie of the blue eyed boy? How large a part of the population was that? Unfortunately, I think a very large part, um, you know, still, and once again, probably all over the world, not only in South Africa, if you think of things like incest in families where mothers just keep quiet, women so often just keep quiet because, especially in traditional societies, and we are told, don't speak up, don't go against the man. Now, in my ideal world, that wouldn't happen. Uh, women would all have a voice and we would speak out and... My other book, my memoirs, is called A Long Letter to My Daughter because I have a daughter who's French and grew up in, with a French father and speaks French. And I needed to explain to her where I come from, but also that she should take up place, that she shouldn't apologize, and that she shouldn't walk behind the man. Like I was taught, you always walk two steps behind, you keep quiet when the, the, the father in the house is right, okay? If you don't, you might not agree, but you don't say it in front of the children. You just, you know, you just keep quiet. Um, so I don't want my daughter to grow up like that. So I, this was important for me. 
were there any points in the book when writing it where you were afraid when you were writing it and going, can I really take it there? Can I really say this? Can I really say that? What were those points if there were any? Or did you have kind of confidence throughout in the story? No, Musa, I don't think I was ever that... Um, I don't think I, I was brave to the point of where I felt, oh, I'm now really pushing it. Uh, no, I felt everything that I was writing came from the story in a way. You know, I didn't have an agenda to say certain things. I tried to, as I say, didn't know the end of the story while I was writing. And I was writing to discover the end and to see where it would go to. So all, also, there's all, always a moment when a book is finished and you've done all the editing and then it takes a while before it's actually published. And then I always get extremely nervous even after writing for many years. It's always like the first time because then you know now it's too late. It's out there. In, the, in my case, I, write, I wrote this book in Afrikaans, my mother tongue, and then it's been translated. The translation is published together with the original Afrikaans. So there's also a longer wait then. There's a translation time so once or so that you're sitting there and you can't change it anymore, but it's not out there and you don't know what the reaction is yet. And that's always very, very stressful. But my only um, defense is I start writing another book. <laughs> I have to forget about that and start thinking about something else. That's a funny thing because you talk about um, one fear that is very real in the book is the fear of being seen as a traitor, betrayal. You talk about betrayal in the memoir and you talk about it in the book in relation to Cuba. Um, in your visit to Cuba as, uh, as a woman your heritage, what parallels did you see between the more modern Cuba and apartheid South Africa in relation to the structures and what differences did you see? Um, the Cuba I saw, I was then 2016, I think. So it changes all the time as you know now. At the moment there's protests in Cuba for the first time in decades. Um, but the Cuba I saw um, reminded me in many ways of the South Africa I knew. And it's completely different ideologies because um, it's communism on the one side and there was a kind of uh, fascist apartheid on the other side. But the effects were censorship, um, cut off from the rest of the world. I'm talking of South Africa in the, in the 80s, 70s, 80s and Cuba. So those are things that for me were interesting because you don't expect it. Um, there's an island nation cut off from the rest of the world. And as I say, there's still a lot of censorship. And that was the country that, uh, um, that I grew up in was also. So yes, and then speaking to Cubans and drawing, and also the war there is still a big thing for many people because you see mutilated people and guys in wheelchairs around you. And when you speak, a lot of soldiers died in that war. I think what's, what's interesting about this as well is um, you look at South Africa and th there's a scene in the book where you talk about these rich English boys going on holiday to, so, to South Africa to meet the beautiful South Africa, well, white South African girls. And I thought to myself, that was funny because I thought what kind of if rich people go anywhere in the world, what an interesting choice to go on holiday in South Africa. But then you talk about the fact that they are kind of not interested in politics, just here for a good time. And I suppose my question is, how easy was it for those people really to ignore what was going on? Because the way you paint it is very interesting. You kind of have it with, I would call it like a knowing innocence. Mm -hmm. It's a, a willful obliviousness, does that make sense? As in a kind yes. of... We're just here for a good time, but we kind of, it's quite a sinister innocence in a way. Could you talk about that to an extent? I think it's something that tourists all over the world can easily do, and it still happens today. You go to a place for a holiday, and in a way, you put a blinkers on because you are there to have a good time, and you tell yourself, okay, I'm helping the economy or whatever because tourism is needed, but they, are things going on in the country which you prefer not to engage with. And I think that's what happened there. Absolutely, and I love that scene because it's very, um, 
it paints it in a very clever way. There's a the sinister backdrop of what's going on, but there's very much the kind of the white people who are the protagonists, and they always get to be the main character in their own lives. That's really interesting the way you paint that. Yeah, unaware of of anything else. So, um, f I think that's also the thing in a in a book like this. Yes, the protagonists are white. Now I put her to Cuba, where she meets people with of all colors. And then, so that was a bit of a challenge to me because you don't want to explain or or right. say this one is black, you know, what, how black, how. So that I just tried to, it had to come out through the story. Right. Um, but you have that problem that a lot, uh, that's a thing with white writing. Yes, yes, you can't, you don't always have to because you assume your characters are white, and then you name the other colors. And I've spoken to black writer friends, and that's a problem because you don't. You write. Oh, if you if a black writer, you don't. You don't. You don't assume the character is white. So you know why should. So that's also things that that I'm still trying to work out. But it's an interesting technical choice because you use, you refer to the skin color of the white people, in relation to the benefits it gives them. You only refer to it in that context. And when you go to Cuba, it's just they're just people. It's really interesting, the yes. kind of choice. Yes. How much did you think about how you used colour in that context? I thought about it because it was something that struck me um, when I was in Cuba, really the, inter, the mixing, the interracial, really all the colours of the rainbow um, in, in the same building, in the same... So, because South Africa, even today, there's still a lot of separation. There are still, you still have mostly white people and some rich black people living in fancy, formerly white um, uh, suburbs. Santon. And yes, Santon, <laughs> yes. And then you have the townships. Um, and then you have the dismally poor townships. Um, uh, and yes, yeah, so, so it's harder. You see it. We often joke in South Africa, you see, um, you know, you see real interracial mixing. No, no, no. I'm absolutely deeply thankful for everybody who's here. And we know that the f it's a miracle that, thanks to Kalaf and Stephanie and everybody, that they, we had this festival after being postponed like three times. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes. But so it's that makes it even the more important that we do a small band of brave men and women who feel deeply for books and culture that we keep on spreading the message. But it's keep, I mean, actually, I want to talk about spreading the message because I want to talk about risks. What are the biggest risks you've taken as a writer, do you feel, to spread a message that's more positive? What are the biggest challenges where, you know, maybe not with this book, but there have there been times you felt where I might get a backlash for saying this, but I'm going to say it. When have you had that? I feel it all the time, but you know, the whole traitor thing doesn't bother me because my, you find your tribe. My tribe in South Africa are across all colors. It's, um, it's people who think like I do. So it's not a thing at all for me, you know, and betraying my, my background or anything like that. that that's not a thing. Um, sometimes, to tell you, to be honest, my first adult book, um, Entertaining Angels, is the English title, it, you, it caused a huge furor in South Africa um, because it was the first time that an, it was originally published in Afrikaans. It won a lot of literary prizes, but it had a lot of sex in and joking about sex from a female feminist point of view. And that shocked people and delighted people and got a lot of reaction. Afterwards, people said to me, oh, but you were so brave, you know, you could write a book like that in Afrikaans. Everybody said it's never been done. And, and I was honestly unaware that I was doing because I read very little Afrikaans at that stage. So nothing that I wrote in there hasn't been said in English, I thought. Um, so I think sometimes we um, fools rush in where angels fear to trade, just because you don't know. I think some literally, if I had to, if somebody had to say to me after that, you know, if, while I was writing it, it's my first book. Suddenly I was like, famous or whatever. I wrote children's books before that. 
um, that you're going to have this huge thing. I might not, I might have censored myself because I was young and I, you know, I didn't know. It was hard to handle. Suddenly you in the spotlight. Um, now I know more. I can't plead innocence anymore. But I absolutely try and whenever I write something that scares me a little bit, I don't think of it. I just don't think of it. I just write it. I don't think who's going to read it because that, that's a bottomless pit if you start thinking what your, your primary school teacher is going to think of this scene and, and maybe your right. preacher. Um, and no, no, no. So or your you mum in my it. case. Yeah. Your mum and dad, yes. <laughs> I want to talk about, I mean, we're, we're coming to the close, but I want to really talk about a theme that emerges Obviously, from the start of your career, you're still going strong now. Um, you, off, you seem to put love, sex, and intimacy at the middle of your works. Why do you use that um, as a vehicle? Why, why, how do you, why do you find that such an effective vehicle for stories? Well, it's not always sex, as in the sex intimacy, act, right. intimacy. Right, intimacy right. and sensuality, to me, is such a part of who we are, that I cannot not take it, take, I cannot not write about it. At the same time, writing about sex is a huge challenge. Um, in, the, in the English, in the Anglophone literary world, there's a bad sex award oh um, yeah, that, yeah. You, that all writers fear. Um, and I sometimes I'm very glad that first I write in Afrikaans before it's translated because some very great, well-known award prize winning writers have won this bad sex award because if you take one paragraph out of context and it's sometimes it's so cringingly embarrassing you cannot believe you want to burst out laughing the purple prose that uh, all that so i just because it's difficult it's also why i try and push myself no don't shy away from sex because you have to do it it's part of life and you have to find, it's like sunsets. I give creative writing classes. I say to, to the students, you know, um, it's like sex and a sunset. It's been done 10 million times in books. <laughs> you have to find an original way to describe a sunset or describe a sex scene or otherwise don't do it. That is probably the moral of the story. That's the best possible way, I think, to round off uh, this wonderful conversation. Um, if we're writing troubling times, find an original way to do it. If it's a revenue you're describing or just a sexual act, <laughs> find a new way to do it. Thank you so much, Marita. An absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening, everyone. And have a wonderful Thank you. Festival. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Musa.